Well, hi, welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graben, and today we're joined by Angel Salucci. She's the owner and CEO of two medical fraud investigation companies, Medical Fraud Fighters and Overbrook Consultants. She's a board-certified family nurse practitioner. She's been a nurse for over 20 years and a family nurse practitioner for almost 10. So with that, Angel, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hi, Mark. I'm great, thanks. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, well, there's a lot um, to talk about. I'm really interested in the work you do and and, and the way you help people. But let's dive right in. Um, What is your favorite mistake? Well, I have to tell you, Mark, this took a lot of reflecting (laughs) because (laughs) I've spent almost 30 years in healthcare. not to mention the fact that I was a candy striper at 13. (laughs) So my whole life I've been in healthcare, And as a nurse, you don't make mistakes because there's a human life on the other side of that. So, excuse me, I've been reflecting more on my journey as an entrepreneur and a business owner Mm -hmm. the last five years. And after a lot of thinking, reflecting, I realized that my biggest mistake, my favorite mistake, I should say. Favorite mistake, right. Right, it's my favorite. (laughs) My favorite mistake was chasing shiny objects. Now, what I mean by that is um, coaches and seminars and um, programs and things like that that just took an absorbent amount of time and money. Now, I know you like specifics. So (laughs) the biggest one I could think of was I actually invested $17,000 to have two people teach me how to use LinkedIn for business. And once I got into the program, I was about two to three weeks in. They weren't going to do the program for me. They weren't going to do anything. They were just going to teach me how to use LinkedIn for business. And once I got about two weeks into it, I realized that, you know, their methodology wasn't resonating with me, how they deliver their message to the world wasn't resonating with me, and also how they were telling me how to use LinkedIn just wasn't resonating with me and how I want to bring my message to the world. So within two weeks, I knew that and I let them go. So thankfully, I got my $17,000 back. Okay. But um, yeah, that was a big eye opener for me. Um, and, and I was so thankful that you asked that kind of question. What was your favorite mistake? Because it really helped me go back and reflect on that. And through that, I think I learned three valuable lessons. Because I think sometimes you have to turn around and look at where you've been, how far you've come, and pick up the lessons along the way. And through looking back at that, I realized the three lessons I learned were discernment that decide who you're going to let speak into you and into your world and make sure they align with your message, your views, your values. So that was really huge, which you would think I would have learned that sooner than 55. But um, so that was the one thing. The other thing I learned was that um, to trust myself, to trust myself first and look inward before I look outward for Mm -hmm. answers. Again, at 55, I think I should have learned a few things along the way. And don't be so quick to pay somebody else to teach you something that you can do. And excuse me, I believe in mentors and coaches and programs and things like that, but I'm just much more um, analytical or discerning, I guess is the right word, when I decide who I'm going to let into my world, because what I'm trying to share with the world is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was the, the other lesson. And then the third lesson, I think I would have to say, And this was a big one for me because I am in the process of creating um, services and products that I want to bring to the world. And I never want to be a shiny object. Mm. I never want to be something that people look at and like, oh, my gosh, I have to get that. Um, But then in the back end, it doesn't bring them any value. You know, and the products and the services that I'm trying to create are not so that you're dependent upon me to do the work, but to empower you and to educate you to do the work. Because I'm not with you when you're at your doctor's office. I'm not with you when you're looking at your medical bills. So my products and services are all about empowerment and education and supporting. So I never want that to be viewed as a shiny object. Um, So and one of my favorite quotes from a long time ago is you learn how you want to be by seeing how you don't. So seeing how I fell, I don't want to say victim, but I fell into the shiny object kind of thing in the beginning. Um, makes me realize that's not something I want to do going forward. I just always want to bring value and trust myself and be discerning of who I allow into my world. So that was very, that took a lot of work. Let me tell you, I've been thinking hard over this and that I thank you for giving me that time, kind of permission to reflect on that kind of stuff. Well, thanks for giving yourself the permission. You looked inward to 
to find that reflection. And yeah, it's funny when, when um, I talk to you know people who are going to be guests on the show, a lot of times the reaction is, oh, I'm going to have to really give some thought and figure out which is my favorite because we all make mistakes and 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 as you you know kind of corrected yourself earlier, uh, a show called My Biggest Mistake that might be depressing. These are meant to be favorite <laughs> mistakes that we've learned from um, right. in some way. So going forward, I guess you you have this this filter or this discernment, as as you put it, um, to to think about needs as you continue to grow different businesses. What what do you need help with? What can you do yourself? Right. Exactly. Right. And being very um, cognizant of that. Like, can I pay somebody to do it? Sure. But how about I learn it myself? Or how about if I see if I already know how to do it? You know what I mean? Like, it's easier to just say, oh, I'll just pay somebody to do that. But, you know, if you really want to, I personally feel this way. If I want to be proud of the product I'm birthing and bringing to the world, I want to know it. I want to develop that, I want to be part of all that, then just paying somebody else to do it. And I think in the beginning, I was so anxious to get this out into the world. I didn't even know what my real message was. I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't even have clarity yet, yeah. you know? And so I just feel like I needed to do that. I needed to refocus and I needed to be very um, intentional with what everything that I do. And now I have great people in my world I have an amazing mentor. I have a strategist that just helps me to see, again, I'm I'm a nurse, so I'm very, very um, <clears throat> detailed oriented. Mm -hmm. And I don't think big. I don't think, you know, I'll think, oh, I'll just make this little, you know, thing right here. And they're like, well, how about if you help a lot of people by doing it this way or thinking that way? And I'm always like, wow, I never thought about it that way. But anyway, so I have different people feeding into me, but they all share my mission and my passion of wanting to help as many people as possible. I mean, I, I guess there's a difference. Um, you know, I mean, I've been in and around healthcare a lot as a consultant. I've never treated a patient. I'm not a clinician, but I, I imagine um, you could fall into a pattern where it's always about the patient who's directly in front of you and, and, and somewhat reacting to the situations as opposed to what you're learning as an entrepreneur about um, the the need and the opportunity to to think further down the road and to be more strategic is that fair to exactly. say or what, what do you think about that? That is spot on and and I also think that it depends on what type of nurse you were. I was an ER nurse, so it was like I treat you and I I don't want to say I treat Very you. Very reactive. Treat you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Well, what, yeah. I'm sorry. You were saying uh, you treat and. Well, this term is you treat and treat and treat, treat, treat them and treat them. Yeah. But it was more about, all right, this is your immediate need. This is how I fix it. This is what we do. And then we move on. So it wasn't, you know, if you came to me as a diabetic with a high sugar at the ER, I'm going to treat you right there for that high sugar. I'm not going to think long term. Let's change your exercise. Let's change your eating. Uh, so that's why I'm very, very much. And that was the type of nurse I was also very in the moment type of thing. So I think you're right. I never thought about that either. That has played out into my business as well, you know, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So, um, oh, so I want to thank you for sharing, you know, that story and that reflection and, and maybe, you know, kind of the, the last question around um, what it was like, what, what it's like, you said you've been an entrepreneur for five years now. Yes. So, um, how much of that interest or the appeal of shiny objects was was it stronger in the first year or two of being an entrepreneur? Is some of that faded as you've become more experienced, um, or was it more a matter of like, if that wasn't a good experience, I got to rethink this? In that one example you shared. No, I think it was definitely more in the beginning, and I think a lot of that was rooted in I was going from my comfort zone medical nursing to something I had no idea what I was doing and thinking I needed to rely on other people. I didn't even know what a profit and loss statement was. I didn't know what, you know, I didn't even have a computer. Like it wasn't my world. So I felt like I needed to chase shiny objects to make sure I was supported well, instead of taking my time and saying, okay, You've learned these critical thinking skills in your former life. How can they apply to this? 
And now as I've been in it a little longer, it's kind of like with anything, you just get more confident and more um, sure of yourself and your decision making the longer you're in something. So now as a, a businesswoman in it five years, I'm at the point now where I want to turn around and help other people in the beginning, especially nurse entrepreneurs, like you can do it. You're actually a lot smarter than you realize. And it's just a different language you have to learn. So mm -hmm. I think it was because of that. I just didn't feel sure of myself as a business person mm -hmm. in the beginning. So yeah, and, and, and I think there's this um, tension, um, you know, when I've been a consultant to healthcare organizations, um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to be a shiny object. Um, and as you were putting it, um, you know, we're, we're trying to teach people how to be self-sufficient and not breed um, dependence. You know, there, there are some really important issues in healthcare related to, you know, I would um, call them and others refer to them as systemic mistakes. Sure. And, um, you know, medication errors. And there might be a temptation for a hospital to bring someone in and say, well, just tell us what the answer is <laughs> versus coming in. And, and what I, you know, not to get into it too much, but it's more a matter of helping the organization say, realize that the answer is within them and their staff and their leaders to figure it out um, on their own. So that, that what you said um, about that kind of resonated with me because of some of my own, if you will, my day job outside of doing the podcast. Right. Well, sure. And also I have to say, I did listen to your one podcast that I listened to all of them, but the one that you did with the gentleman who was the consultant talking about how he went into that uh, communications company in Philadelphia. This is Jim Benson. Yeah. Yes. So they wanted him to come in and just tell us how to fix it. Just do it. Well, no, you have to learn internally. And then when he did what they asked him to do, they didn't like it. Yeah. It didn't resonate with them, but then turned out in the end, once they realized that then, you know, it took a few years, but then they realized, oh yeah, Jim was right, you know? So, but you're right. Many times we just want people to come in, just fix it. Just tell me what to do. And I don't want to do that for my clients, the people that I serve, because then you're dependent on me and that's not good. You, we should all be dependent on ourselves and step into our own power to fix it. You just don't have the tools yet. You know, somebody once said to me, you know, people say, oh, I can't remember names very well. Well, it's just because you weren't taught how. Mm -hmm. So people may not know how to read their medical bills or they don't know how to spot errors. Well, that's just because you haven't been taught how. That's all, you know. So once you have the skills, then it's easier. Yeah. So let, let's let's talk about um, mm -hmm. your your businesses and, and medical fraud fighters in particular of like, how do you, you know, the the the, the balance, how do you find the balance between looking at a patient's bill versus teaching patients how to look at bills and um, talk about some of the services and, and the approach that, that, that you offer to help people protect themselves from fraud, waste, or abuse. Um, well, the way I look at it is kind of as a pyramid, an upside down pyramid. Mm -hmm. My goal is to just teach everybody how to do it themselves. Let me share my knowledge, my tools, so that you're empowered. <clears throat> For those people who need a little more help, well, then we have a, a do it with you, where I'll review your bills for you, but then I'm going to teach you what to say as you negotiate them on your own behalf. And then I also, we do have services that are done for you, done for you, where we'll review your medical bills and we will negotiate on your behalf. And typically those are people who have over like $100,000 in medical bills. Mm -hmm. Certainly somebody who has thousand dollars worth of medical bills they wouldn't need that service but they do need to know how to look at their bills and how to understand them and i teach them really the premise of what i teach is how to recognize the most common types of billing fraud and i want people to change the thought in their head like i know people say that you're guilty until you're proven innocent i look at all of my bills especially medical bills as innocent as guilt Wait, they say you're innocent until well, you're proven the, guilty. The courts say, our justice system says, yeah, you right. innocent until proven guilty, but your stance looking at bills is... They're guilty until I prove them as innocent, until I verify them. And, and so why, why do you say that? It's just, is that because billing errors are so common? Oh, Mark. <laughs> so I have another company, Overbrook Consultants, where we review medical bills for insurance carriers to identify signs of fraud, waste, and abuse. <clears throat> and I looked at the records that we reviewed just over the last three years, a little over a thousand records. 93% of them contained errors and or blatant fraud. 
Wow. Nine out of 10 of the bills were wrong. So that means that your listeners, nine out of 10 of the medical bills you get in the mail could contain errors. And we wouldn't know that unless we were reading them. So yes, I did get ahead of myself before there, but <clears throat> excuse me, unless you're reading your bills and people are afraid to, because they're overwhelming. And it's almost like you need a secret decoder ring. Like they make them cryptic because they don't want you <laughs> to understand them. So what I first want to teach people is, you know what, when you get a bill in the mail, again, if it's just a $500 bill for something simple, you don't really have to go that much into it. But anything over $1,000, I tell people, get an itemized bill. Yeah. And the difference between an itemized bill and a regular bill is um, they're going to give you a line by line explanation of everything that you've received. I want people to start requesting them um, because that's when you're going to see what you were blatantly being charged for. And um, you have to be, and that's the other thing I teach people is you have to start documenting stuff, everything, whether you, when you make the appointment or when you step foot into a hospital, you should be documenting every single thing that occurs because then you want to compare that to what your bill is you're being charged for. And especially somebody who's uninsured, somebody who's a cash pay patient, which we have so many uninsured people now since COVID hit. And we have people receiving medical bills over a million dollars who have been treated for COVID. So now has never been a more important time to take ownership of your medical bills. And um, one of the things that I'd like to share with your audience is I've created a four-step system. It's not anything you can purchase. It's just something to keep in mind is that you wanna be implementing the Dove system because the Dove system will give you financial peace of mind, knowing that you're keeping your hard earned money where it belongs, in your pockets. Number one, D, you wanna document everything that occurs. Like I said, from the minute you enter a doctor's office until, the, um, uh, until that bill has been paid. O stands for organize. You wanna have everything related to your medical expenses in one location because then that also gives you a sense of control. V is to verify. You want to verify everything that is on that bill and align it with what you have in your journal or wherever you're keeping track. And then E is for engage. And engage is based on whatever you found or didn't find when you were reviewing. If you find nothing to be wrong and you could pay the bill, then you pay it. If you found it to be found errors, Depending on what you found, if it was blatant fraud, you reach out to certain people. And if it's, you know, just an error with that your doctor's office made, then you would just call them and let them know, hey, I found an error. And doing that alone, like creating, just utilizing those four steps is going to make you feel more empowered and more in control of your medical bills. And I, I get the connection between you, you call, the Dove system and peace of mind. We, I'm so glad you get that. With peace, yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's right. A good way of remembering that. Um, so how often do you have to teach people then? You've sort of alluded to it. How to bring up an error and who to talk to. Um, that, that's not, is that not always straightforward? Well, if you think it's blatant fraud, well, the first thing I would just tell people, so I don't have to go too detailed, is reach out to whoever you got the bill from. Okay. That's your first step. first step. So um, if you have health insurance, you would reach out to your insurance provider and say, hey, I was billed for this, but I did not receive it. They may handle it for you. And that's the other thing. If you need them to handle anything for you, you pay them a lot of money. <laughs> you can ask them to handle stuff. Yeah. Or you would reach out to your provider, you know, and say, hey, I found this error. And I always tell people to err on the side of human error. Don't go right to fraud, even if it is fraud. Give people an opportunity. So, for example, another area of fraud is pharmacy fraud, where they're shortchanging people um, pills, if, especially if you get a 90-day order. And this has happened to me twice. Uh, it was actually two six, within a, a six-month period. It happened to me two times. And each time, you know, could I think it was fraud? Sure. But instead, I took it back to the pharmacy. And I'm like, you know what? You guys are probably so busy. And I went home and I counted these and I'm 10 short. Can I please have my 10 pills? You know, that kind of thing. So I gave them the opportunity to step up to the plate. You know, I wasn't saying, hey, you committed fraud. You know, I didn't do that. So anyway, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that helps because, I mean, it's, um, the, you know, the, the theme of this podcast, is, as many guests say, and I say, we all make mistakes. 
And to your point, when people are busy and overloaded, as we know, we've seen news reports of, you know, about retail pharmacies and, and different quality problems. Um, it's, it's not due to a bad person. It's, it's often uh, a systemic factor, human error, systemic error, um, not a bad thing to assume instead of intent. And I imagine in some cases, human error or mistake versus blatant fraud that ends up being battled out in the legal venue, I guess. Sure. Unless, well, unless you bring it to their attention and then they change it, you know, and it doesn't have to go down that far, but there are definitely fraudulent things. And the difference between fraud and abuse is abuse is um, charging somebody more than something is really worth. So hospitals are notorious for raising their prices by 400 to 500%. Like that's a lot of money. Now it's not fraud because you are getting the service, but what they're charging you is kind of like over the top. But fraud is, and you're right, there's human error and then there's fraud. And fraud is when you are intentionally trying to get paid for something that they have no right to. And the four most common things that we saw in reviewing all the records for Overbrook was either billing for services that were not delivered. So an example of that, my mother received a bill for an office visit for $500. And when she looked at the date of service, she wasn't even in the state on that day. She was at her house in Florida and they live in Pennsylvania. So it's kind of like that. And she brought it up to Medicare's attention. The other thing we see a lot of is double billing. And double billing would be, um, we were reviewing records for a client and I knew he had a same day procedure. So I called him and I said, how many IVs did you have? And he said, one. I said, okay, you were billed for six. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of intentional, you know. Um, and then upcoding, and that is where, you know, if you saw your provider for a cold, but they billed you for a pneumonia. Now, why that's bad is you also now have pneumonia as a diagnosis on your medical record <laughs> instead of a cold. So there's many layers to this. Right. And then the fifth most common thing we see, especially if somebody has blood work or a surgical procedure done, is called unbundling. And this is when they're parsing out and charging you for every single item instead of that one bundle fee that they should be. It's kind of like having to pay individually for every item on a value meal, you know, yeah. the cup, the straw, the lid, the ice, and, and that kind of thing. But Mark, one thing I do want to say, because, you know, fraud and abuse is very scary and nobody wants to um, be fearful of the healthcare system. I don't want that. I want them to know that nine out of 10 of your medical bills could contain errors. And I also want you to realize, your listeners to realize that you have more power than you realize. I want you to trust your providers. I don't want you to not trust them, but I want you to come to the table realizing that you have more at stake than they do because it's your life. Mm -hmm. And you just want to just be a more engaged, a more um, aware and a more empowered consumer of healthcare because it is a consumer transaction. You know, you're paying them for a service. So I just want people to feel more empowered and uh, in control of their healthcare needs and medical expenses. Yeah. Well, thank you for for all of that. And I I think, you know, we would be in agreement when, 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 when things are a simple mistake, we would hope the pharmacy or the hospital or whatever that organization is um, learns from those mistakes instead of just correcting them over and over and over again, kind of keeping the theme of, of the show. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. And thank you for sharing, um, you know, kind of the, the, the mistake you were reflecting upon um, as an entrepreneur. And I want to make sure people know about um, your website, medicalfraudfighters.com, correct? correct. Yes, thank you. And I know um, when I was looking at the website, there's a free ebook that's available if you want to tell the listeners a little bit about that and what they can get. Yes, I would love it if you can go and check out the ebook because if you go to the website, it'll be the first thing you see. Why that's important, and Mark, I'll have to come back another time for this. <laughs> first of all, the name of the ebook is called The Five Things You Can Do to Protect Yourself from Medical Fraud and Abuse. It doesn't talk about the medical billing fraud, what we're talking about today. There are actually organized crime rings who are trying really, really hard to get your insurance information to steal your money or to steal from the healthcare system, which we are funding through our FICA tax, you know? And um, an example of that would be, um, there was, so anyway, in the ebook, I'm sorry, in the ebook, I teach you how to protect your medical identity, 
how to have a more collaborative relationship with your provider by asking the appropriate questions, because that's what every provider wants. They want an engaged and empowered collaborative relationship with their patients um, and what kind of records you should be keeping and all of that kind of stuff. So that's what the ebook talks about. But <clears throat> excuse me, I'll give you an example of uh, a fraud ring, which we all have those telemarketers, scammers, all this. Those are fraud rings. That's not medical people doing that. Those are the organized crime rings. And one example, it was called Operation Brace Yourself, and it cost the taxpayers, it cost the Medicare system, but again, we are the Medicare system, um, $6 billion. And what they were doing is they were calling people, Medicare recipients, so anybody over the age of 65, and asking them, do you have any knee pain or back pain Mm -hmm. or elbow pain? And of course, who doesn't have pain over 65? (laughs) You know, that's the least of our problems. And if they said yes, they said, well, your insurance carrier has agreed for us to ship you a back brace. They would give them the information. And as soon as they did, they did get the brace, but they would send them a brace that was worth $10. And then they billed Medicare $999 for each brace because $1,000 is the red flag tipping point that flags Medicare. And it cost the taxpayers $6 billion. So, you know, sometimes people say, well, why should I care? You know, I have Medicare and all this kind of stuff. And I, and then I, I think to myself, okay, Medicare recipient, you probably have grandkids. Do you want them to have better schools? Do you want to have better roads? Because that's where all of our tax money goes. But no, we're giving it to criminals, you know, and just, I don't care who's paying for it. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Like, right. so that's, that's more, and the ebook doesn't get into all that, but it teaches because it's only like 10 pages, but that's the premise of it, that we have to just protect your medical ID as if it is gold, because in the wrong hands, that information is gold. It's a blank check. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Our guest, uh, again, has been Angel Salucci, and um, you can find uh, her website, medicalfraudfighters.com. So I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for being a guest here on My Favorite Mistake. Thank you. This was fabulous. Thank you, Mark, so much.